said earlier everybody had a good lunch and uh, but that you're ready to take a nice deep breath and listen we have uh, this session and we're going to have our panel later so uh, all the questions are in and uh, then we'll we'll try to answer those we're going to be talking right now about destined to worship and serve Uh, again dr Stuart McAllister spoke with us yesterday um, back once again uh, to, to share with us been with RZIM since 1998 and is now directing the uh, Americas, the, the American region, but yet here in Asia with us. We're glad to have you. Please come on up and, and share with us. Thank you. Well, good afternoon. I'm sorry that I gave birth to a son that doesn't have a Scottish accent. <laughs> I don't know how that works, you know. I mean, I was in the same house. We shared it, but uh, apparently only, only the American side rubs off. That's why we were trying to have that vote yesterday. <laughs> <laughs> it's uh, great to be where, uh, with you, and many of the churches are hosts, and uh, thank you for the very, very warm welcome we've had here in Hong Kong, and uh, for the team, this excellent team that we can uh, pair or join up with. I think one of the, the joys that I have had, and all of the younger ones say the exact same thing, 
is that as we come together in different combinations, um, we just know that we all have a synergy together. And we love that uh, we, don't, uh, we don't have the same temperaments, the same orientation, but yet there is something that binds us together. And uh, we really, really love that. We love being together. And uh, I see my family and Tracy, my other daughter, we consider her part of our family. Um, she's stayed with us many times, and so we've just decided to keep her. So we've got a piece of Asia in our home as well. <laughs> You know, one of my favorite stories was told a number of years. It's a preacher's story, but it really fits because I know what you have the agony that some of you have been going through. Um, you're sitting here saying, I can't know if I can endure this, but I, I, I don't want to go away. So this pastor was invited um, to give a, you know, a kind of homily. It was an evening out, and there was a parent teachers association. And he was, the committee said, would you mind just giving a little devotional, but please understand, like 10, maximum 15 minutes, but you really must take this very seriously because there are babysitters, there are buses, there are all kinds of factors, so we really need to take this serious. And of course, the pastor, like many other preachers, oh, no problem. So the evening comes, and they do the business. There's hundreds of parents present, and the pastor duly gets up and begins to share his devotional message. But as he's working along, he's in 10 minutes and he's in full swing. 15 minutes, he goes sailing past the 15-minute mark. He's going to 20, and the guy who's organized the meeting and invited him is, is panicking. He's seeing babies' diapers unchanged. He's seeing buses filled. He sees marriages breaking down, fights in the car on the way home. 25 minutes, he's positively exasperated. And as it's moving towards half an hour, now the man is just literally having terror attacks. So he looks around, and the only thing he can see is the hammer for bringing the meeting to order. So he takes the hammer, and as the guy is speaking, he throws the hammer at him, at the pastor. But just then, he was making a drastic point. He bends down, the hammer goes past him, and it hits a man on the front row on the head. And as he fell off the chair, slipping into unconsciousness, someone heard him say, please hit me again. I can still hear him. <laughs> so I hope that's not how you feel today. <laughs> the Bible in all of life is a love story. It's not an imaginary story. It's a story. Story is about the nature of existence. And the Bible is a love story. The central issue of the Bible and all of life, all of humanity, is the question of love, as was mentioned both in the talk on suffering and the existential longings of the human heart. But the greatest challenge to love in a real world in which there is a God and love is the primary issue of existence is that idolatry is what you and I will fight with all of our life. Idols that seek to steal the heart and the mind and offer alternative seductions. And so the biggest battle then to the Christian, to the person who says they love God, is going to be the battle for faithfulness. How do we stay centered? How do we worship? How do we serve? How do we stay focused? I want us to begin by the gospel with looking at the gospels in Matthew chapter 4 with the coming of our Lord and the beginning of his earthly ministry. In Matthew chapter 4, in verses 12 through 17, now, when Jesus heard that John had been taken into custody, he withdrew into Galilee, and leaving Nazareth, he came and settled in Capernaum, which is by the sea in the region of Zebulun and Naphtali. This was to fulfill what was spoken through Isaiah the prophet, the land of Zebulun, the land of Naphtali, by the way of the sea, beyond the Jordan, Galilee of the Gentiles. The people who were sitting in darkness saw a great light, and those who were sitting in the land of the shadow of death, upon them a light dawned. From that time, Jesus began to preach and say, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Over in chapter 5, in verses 14 through 16, Jesus, in his famous Sermon on the Mount, said, you are the light of the world. A city set on a hill cannot be hidden, nor does anyone light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on the lampstand, and it gives light to all who are in the house. Let your light shine before men in such a way that they may see your good works and glorify your Father who is in heaven. Leslie Newbigin was a bishop of the uh, South Indian Church. He was an Anglican missionary in India. And has a profound understanding and reflection on Christianity and culture. And this is what Newbigin said. God had acted in, in a way that if believed must henceforth determine all of our ways of thinking. It could not merely fit into existing ways of understanding the world without fundamentally changing them. So here is Newbigin thinking on the Christ event. He's thinking on that incarnational moment, and he realizes that something either cataclysmic, something very significant has taken place, or it's an event of no great proportions. If this was God manifest in the flesh, then it redefines everything. 
And so the very nature of the claims about Jesus is a challenge, an alternative to the status quo of life. This is what Newbigin says. According to Athanasius, one of the church fathers, it provided a new archae, a new starting point for all human understanding of the world. It could not form a part of any worldview except one of which it was the basis. So the whole idea of the, the, the Christian revelation, which bought into the bigger story of creation, fall, redemption, and eschaton, was a transformational issue in, in human history and in our experience. And the incarnation is a central part of that. N.T. Wright, who's a, a British uh, bishop and historian, teaches at St. Andrews University, says this, Jesus of Nazareth poses a question and a challenge 2,000 years after his lifetime. The question is fairly simple. Who exactly was he? This includes the questions. What did he think he was up to? What did he, what did he do and say? Why was he killed? And did he rise from the dead? C.S. Lewis, meditating on this many years later, would look at these same this information, these facts, and say, if it's not real or true, then of course this is completely irrelevant, which is what the new atheists say. It's just a religious story with no ramifications for existence whatsoever, ever. But if it is true, if this is talking about reality, then this is the supreme event of the cosmos, and therefore it has significance for every area of life. So the Christian is not talking about that my heart was just strangely warmed or a private encounter that happened to me. We are talking about something we believe that happened in the universe in an actual space-time event and has ramifications for all of life, including philosophy, theology, and everything, because we, we tie this not to a faith that we believe, but to events in which the faiths are placed. The events are the primary uh, activity. And so in the Bible, you have this inauguration of the kingdom of God. Jesus didn't come and preach the gospel of personal salvation, which is so much of what we do these days. He came to announce and herald the kingdom of God, the rule of God, the government of God. Now, N.T. Wright says, if you read the gospels for the first time and you pick some friend from another background, from Buddhist background, from Islamic background, or from, from uh, basically just the corporate world of atheist background or whatever, and you hand them a gospels and they read, their, it's like something from another planet. What is this thing? And N.T. Wright suggests we hit some questions. He says, we hear them, and it's from a strange foreign world in time, distance in culture and ideas. How can that have anything to say to us or to our world? Don't we hear that all the time? How would you take a 2,000-year-old text or book or 6,000-year-old, if you include the Old Testament, and, and have anything to say to the modern world of ethics and investment and so forth? Secondly, Jesus, God is strange to us. We have brought in general concepts of God or gods, but which God are we meaning? And thirdly, the last relates to the other two. Jesus spoke and acted as if he was in charge. And that brings a huge problem, especially to moderns. We don't like words like rule, follow, and obey. Why? Because you and I are children of the modern world. We are Democrats, right? <laughs> well, maybe, I, mean, I mean, there might be a few Republicans in here, but you know what I'm talking about. We're, we're all like choice. It's all about choice. We live in the king. Did Jesus really believe he was king? How can you live with kingship in an age of autonomous individualism? Does he have real authority or not? You see, if you're here as a Christian, and we're talking about designed to worship and serve, then you turn to the end of all the Gospels, and you find there was things that we call the Great Commission. Matthew 20, 18 through 20, Jesus says, all authority on heaven and on earth has been given to me. He then says, go ye therefore into all the world and preach the gospel. John chapter 20, as the Father sent me, so send I you. In Acts chapter 1, they are gathering together. They're told to wait in Jerusalem until they receive power from on high. And it wasn't just about power to entertain them. It wasn't power to just give them some kind of energy to make their teeth go gold or something like that. It wasn't power to make them happy and clappy. It was power to witness to the kingdom of God. Newbegin says this, the business of the church is to tell and embody a story, the story of God's mighty acts in creation and redemption and of God's promises concerning what will be in the end. The church affirms the truth of this story by doing what? Celebrating it, interpreting it, and enacting it in the life of the contemporary world. 
So that's what church has to do. We celebrate the life of Christ. We did this as we opened up. But we have to interpret it. We have to translate this into worlds like in, in Taiwan and in the Philippines and Germany and in New York City and Vancouver. We have to interpret this story into the categories. That means our work is mission impossible should you decide to accept it. And this Bible may self-destruct in 30 seconds. You're being given a mission where translation under the power of the Holy Spirit is what you and I are called to. But that means we need to know our text and know our story because if we translate wrongly, we give the wrong message. We confuse people. We may give them bad theology. We may give them bad ethics. We may give them bad practices. So we've got to be clear. There's a huge responsibility in this. There's also a privileged call, and that's the challenge of the church. So right from the very opening of scriptures, the clash of worlds, the clash with cultures, beliefs, and society, the message is always going to be contested. But the Bible is clear that the word, the light had come and that that light was shining in the darkness. Look at John chapter 1. If you have your Bibles or your iPad or your iPod or whatever version of electronic technology or whatever, anyway, John chapter 1, verse 4, and this is one of my favorite verses in the Bible because I really love this. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. Our God is in the life business. That's what Christianity is all about. The light shines in the darkness. The darkness did not comprehend it. Verse 9, there was the true light which coming into the world enlightens every man. So something has happened in the world. Not everybody understands because we talk about suppressing the truth in unrighteousness in Romans chapter 1. But there's an awareness that there seems to be something more to reality than meets the eye. And there is, ladies and gentlemen. There's more than just your senses. There's more than just your measuring rods. There's something bigger in reality. But there are alternative ultimates out there. What is truth and says who, right? That's the postmodern claim today. James Edward puts it this way. The rules by which a game is played affect the outcome of the game. And the rule that all events must be accounted for by natural causes rather than supernatural ones is technically known as naturalism. And there is a massive trend today towards these, these monistic thoughts around the world where we try to, to, to shove everything under one rubric. Methodological nat naturalism, not atheism necessarily, is, is the real struggle. People get it in the sciences. They get it not that by being a methodological naturalist in practice you have to become a philosophical atheist in reality, but many people do. And methodological naturalism is a worldview. And so what we are seeing is the rise of what we call scientism. Began in Europe, spread through the United States, and it's kind of gone global and viral. The new atheists carry it with them, and they adopt a worldview that's largely called scientism. This is not Christians against science. Scientism is a philosophical view. It's not a requirement of being a scientist. Scientism is the belief that all valid knowledge is science. Scientism says, or at least it implicitly assumes, that rational knowledge is scientific and that everything else that claims the status of knowledge is just superstition, irrationality, emotion, or nonsense. I have sat with people who are essentially accusing us of that. I have said that you know, no, no person with a rational brain, with a, a graduate degree or a postgraduate degree, could really intelligently believe in God. And yet I have friends who are scientists, doctors, you know, in all kinds of areas of life who hold their scientific degree, which was earned, and believe in God and see no contradiction whatsoever. They're seamless in their worldview. We are not, as Christians, therefore, commending a private option. We're not saying that, you know, be a Christian and tuck Jesus away in your heart so that you can live some kind of private, neutralized life in a corner and stay in the closet and hide. The gospel is public truth. Christ has come, Christ has risen, and Christ will come again. Os Guinness put this very well. Belief in something doesn't make it true. Only truth makes a belief true. So Jesus has brought new life. Again, the John chapter 1, verse 4. In him was life, and that life was the light of men. I love it what Michael Green says, that Jesus Christ did not come to make bad people good. He came to make dead men live. So when I'm sharing the gospel, and what my son Cameron was talking about this morning was so profound because this is really the heart of why we've had many conversations in our home. We've talked to people. I don't feel I'm selling something. I don't feel I'm trying to impose a morality on people. That's not my agenda. We're in the life business. Because if I understand the Scriptures clearly, there are two streams of humanity. There is already a new type of humanity in the universe. 
Well, the first is, comes from Adam. And the Bible says, as in Adam, all die. So every human being, it doesn't matter how nice and polished you are and all toasty and well made up and whatever today, you have an appointment and I have an appointment with death. It's the great leveler. I don't want to rain on the parade, but you know, you can't expect it's going to happen. I mean, it is, let's face it. But as in Adam all die, so in Christ shall all be made alive. Jesus is the firstborn of a new creation. He has unleashed a new kind of life, eternal life. And that life is what it is that we are sharing. The eternal life begins. And so Jesus offers not just a set of ideas, not a religious philosophy, not another system. In John 14, 6, he says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And in our culture, if I was to go into Stanford University or Yale or Harvard or even here in Hong Kong, and we were to say that Jesus said, I am a way, a truth, a life, that would be acceptable. That would be acceptable as a cultural statement, as a pluralistic contribution to the wider cultural dialogue of the, of the, the, the diversity of religions. But Jesus didn't say, I am a way. He said, I am the way, the truth, and the like. Now, that means it might be wrong. He may be lying. He may be a lunatic. He may be confused. That may be a legendary statement. There's all kinds of objections. Or, of course, it might be real. And that's why we have to put our thinking caps off, because the people you share with will believe one of those options. They won't believe necessarily it's true, and we have to persuade them of why we see it is. But you see, Jesus is a way. The modern world functions with a kind of a mantra. Rational men and women in control of their destiny. Hong Kong produces these en masse, right? All the fund managers, all the corporate lawyers, all the business managers, all the technicians, all the people who go and get the best technology degrees, who can control and order. And we like this idea of, 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 of education and tests. We like the idea of being rational human beings in control of our life. That's why we like these television programs like Survivor, where people go out there, it's the survival of the fittest baby, or American Idol, where you can get your, 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 your talent, or dance with the stars so we can see the supreme. We can win at any cost. The triumph of, of skill and power and ability and build ourselves and, and educate ourselves and get out there and, and establish ourselves. Or maybe that's just an illusion that we are a different kind of being in a different kind of world made for a different kind of context, and we need help to be human, to connect to the source of our life. I read to you some of your yesterday, Proverbs chapter 2, where it says, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. The knowledge of the Holy One is understanding. You know, I can remember the day in Glasgow, Scotland, when I walked into a house. And I, the idea of God, I said yesterday, I was telling some of you that, that it was just repulsive. And I mean, I have struggled as a Christian. I know that be shocking you, I'm sorry, but I've struggled even being a Christian. I think, I'm, I think I'm wired to be more a little bit outside. Some of our silliness in the evangelical church and some of the things we do and some of the hypocrisies. I mean, I could write an apologetic against the church better than the people that I read, trust me. But because I've met God, I know it's real. And that holds me through the story. But I love the gospel. I love the forgiveness of sins. And I remember walking into this house and these people, and hear me walking in, not that I had read, but I mean, I hadn't seen God. I mean, Yuri Gagarin had been up to space and the Russians said they looked around. They didn't see him up there either. So there couldn't have been one. And hey, I was into Star Trek. I'm sure if they got out there to the other side of the universe, they would have found that there's other planets and you know, this God stuff was all nonsense. I had every kind of reason and rationalization in my soul for why there wasn't a God. These people testified, they share. I see a woman that's been converted by God's grace and I knew something something had happened. It went from believing there is no God to suddenly, as after a couple of hours of me being a stupid and throwing out all kinds of silly objections, of thinking, oops, there might be a God. Then, oops, there is a God, and I'm in trouble. Because I knew what I had done. I had hurt people. I had done ugly things. I mean, I didn't need to be convicted of sin. I didn't, the Ten Commandments had broken almost every one of them. Trust me. And I went up to the bathroom in that house in Bailiston in Glasgow, and I knelt behind the toilet, and that was appropriate, believe you me. And I said, God, if you're there, I want to know you. And it happened. Now, can I come in here and come and say, you know, my life is wonderful, and it's been, you know, I've been flying on clouds of heavenly glory, and, you know, everything's been one. No, I've struggled and bumped and scraped. Christ has been with me. And Christ has given me a family and a home and a calling and the privilege of preaching his gospel. And I believe it. And I hope you do too. The mandate, Luke chapter 24, the end of, his, the end of Luke's gospel. Listen to these words from 45 through 48. He, then he opened the mind, the Lord Jesus, 
to the disciples and to understand the scriptures. And he said to them, thus it is written that Christ would suffer and rise again from the dead the third day, that repentance for the forgiveness of sins would be proclaimed in his name to all the nations beginning from Jerusalem. You are witnesses of these things. You know, one of the things I like about doing this, and I think people may misunderstand this, our job is not to convert people. Our job is not to answer every question. Our job is to witness to the king. God's the one who converts, not us. We share the gospel, we trust the Holy Spirit, but we use argumentation and we use evidence where that is important. But this notion of authority here is very, very strong. The Lord doesn't give us invitations and just say, take it or leave it. He commands us to go. There's an external authority in this. Jesus gives clear commands. And it's amazing how much in our church, they're not commands, they're options, aren't they? I mean, for many of us in the church, we read these verses, but we don't do them. We talk, Jesus tells us to pray. We don't pray. He tells us to forgive. We don't forgive. He tells us to evangelize. We don't do evangelize. He tells us to give, but that's all right. You still come to church and you do put a little bit of money in the offering and go out just as you were, remember? Or do we get serious? John chapter 14, verse 15, listen to Jesus' words here. If you love me, what will happen? You will keep my commandments. Verse 21, he who has my commandments and keep them, it keeps them is the one who loves me, and he who loves me will be loved by my Father, and I will love him, and I will disclose myself to him. And ladies and gentlemen, I want to suggest to you that the primary issue in most of our lives is not a belief problem, it's a love issue. Many of you have all kinds of beliefs. You've read theological books. You'll go to seminars. You'll be at this seminar this week. You'll be at the next one next week because the church has got another one. And then the week after, there'll be another chart. And then they'll have Tim Keller come through and whoever. And you'll, be, you'll suffer from seminaritis. <laughs> and you'll fill up your notebooks. And you'll say, oh, that was really cool. And you'll pass the CDs around. But if you don't really love him, it will make no difference at all. Because the key is what you do with what you know. If you love me, you will keep my commandments. Dietrich Bonhoeffer was a pastor of the Lutheran Church. He was in Germany. He's from one of the top of the food chain, highly educated German, raised in one a very good family, and of course was there at the time when the Nazis took, uh, took power. And because he was a highly educated German, his family were involved in the government and saw what was coming, and it was a horrible story. And Bonhoeffer was a very radical Christian. He was a European Christian. He was in the Lutheran Church. He wouldn't fit into all of our squeaky categories. But he loved his Lord. Listen to what Bonhoeffer said. The commandment of Jesus must be accorded perfect obedience in one's daily vocation of life. The conflict between the life of the Christian and the life of the world was thus thrown into the sharpest possible relief. It was hand-to-hand combat between the Christian and the world. Now, I I don't think we need to get uh, maybe overly concerned, but the fact is for most of us, it's not hand-to-hand comfort. It's just open hands and receiving. We don't struggle. But for Bonhoeffer, there was a battle for faithfulness. And he said this, only he who believes is obedient and only he who is obedient believes. Now, if you think those are just words, you need to understand that when things began to get hot in Germany, American friends tried to bail Bonhoeffer out and they brought him to the United States. And he came for a couple of weeks and then he suddenly realized as he was being offered a a theological position, he was given security, he was away from the Nazis, he was away from all the struggle. He suddenly realized what had happened. He was leaving the German people that he was dedicated as a pastor to serve. And he couldn't do it. He realized he'd made a, a profound mistake. And after only two weeks, he got a ticket back to Germany, which ultimately led to his arrest. And not at that point, but later on because of the Valkyrie plot and his uh, uh, execution in Flossenburg camp in April of 1945. He paid the price, but he was willing, if that's what it took, to follow his Lord. So following his way, what does that mean? As Christians, we're called to get involved in the life of the kingdom of God. You see that in the life of the great saints, Augustine, St. Paul, William Wilberforce, Charles Colson, many others down to the modern time. And that means discipleship. It means not just attending church. It means being in a transformational lifestyle so that I begin to discipline my habits and my lifestyle. Dallas Willard and Don Simpson put it this way. Although every human being is formed spiritually for better or worse, spiritual formation for the Christian Christian refers to the Holy Spirit-driven process of forming the inner world of the human self in such a way that it becomes like the inner being of Christ himself. And how do we know that's working? To the degree that spiritual formation in Christ is successful, the outer life of the individual becomes a natural expression of the character of the teaching of Jesus. I know I'm not perfect, trust me. I know that I don't have all together, but I can tell you there are things that have changed in my life over the years. And I know the Holy Spirit is still working on my life. He's probing. 
I am saved. I am being saved, and I will be saved. Thank God. There's three tenses to the the verb of salvation, by the way, isn't there? But Christ comes and he calls us to higher things, to you young men and women to get serious about your disciplines, to get serious about prayer, to get serious about scripture, to get serious about these things, to you older people, to don't give up the ghost and just go home and watch TV all night or just look for a bit of another holiday off to Cancun and another big car. By all means, have the cars, have fun, but live a life of dedicated service. Don't become a modern narcissist where we sing the, the Beethoven's favorite song. Me, 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 it's all about me. <laughs> Character, manner, and how we treat people. Light for the world. Frank Laubach famously said this, the simple program of Christ for winning the whole world is to make each person he touches magnetic enough with love to draw others. You know, when I meet particularly, ladies and gentlemen, you Asian Christians, you're wonderful. You really are. I'm not just saying that. I mean, one of the privileges for traveling, my son's been here, I think, for the first time too, is meeting the church from around the world and seeing your kindness and your generosity, the energy and the spark. You guys have got something to give and you need to carry it out there into the world. And I know the missionary hearts here. I know these churches are working all over the place. But places like Europe, where the lights to the embers are going out, where you see the advance of, of secularization and, and Islam and other kinds of things taking more of the content. We need voices of people like you with education, with erudition, with ability to come back and say, no, I believe in God. I believe there's a, there are reasons for this kind of thing. And you demonstrate the credibility of the gospel. You demonstrate its global profundity. You show that this message is spreading. So please hear this. And please be involved. Sacrificial love, suffering love, servant love. These are our apologetics, ladies and gentlemen. We show the love of God. We find ways to engage with human beings. Listen to Willard again in Simpson. There is no effectual response to our current situation except for the children of light to be who they're called to be by Christ their head. Only when those who know that Jesus Christ is the light of the world take up their stand with him and fulfill fill their calling from him to be children of light where they are, will there be any realistic hope of stemming the tide of evil? I'm amazed. I'm still involved with Operation Mobilization, and uh, I Ching and I were both members of that for many years, and my wife's on the board of the U.S. Mission. It's a blood and guts organization, but YWAM, Youth for Christ, some of these are... I love the stories we hear. These young men and women, I've got friends that go out, they go into the darkest corners. They try to rescue girls in prostitution. They get into places that you shouldn't even really be, and it's not safe to be, and they do all kinds of nutty things, and God protects them and uses them to bring seeds of His glory and seeds of His hope. We had friends that stayed with us a couple of weeks ago that worked with the Bias Gypsies in, in the Croatia and Hungary and Romania. These are people that in Europe are the absolute off-scouring. They live with incestuous relations. There is violence and alcohol. You would not believe the horror. But because they went there in 2002, there is now a church planting movement. The Bible has been translated in 12 years. And you've hundreds of them coming together now singing Jesus' song. And families being restored. Because of what? Because Christ is risen. And because Christ's people have gone. We need to do both of those. Celebrate His rising and be involved in His mission. But ladies and gentlemen, we face a struggle. We live in occupied territory. I love history and my family will testify to this. I like books on history. I have got a collection of die-cast model airplanes, which my dear friend Bernard contributed to one of the times I was here in China. As we went over to China, got a plane from a factory. It was absolutely marvelous. But during World War II, particularly in the early days, 1940, what they called the phony war, Britain was surrounded. Here was this country cut off. The whole continent was conquered by the Nazis. That had given them all the armaments and all of the additional soldiers of all those countries, including the, the weapons of Czech, Czech, Czechoslovakia, which Britain surrendered. But that's a whole other issue. Anyway, <laughs> the point was Britain couldn't do anything. Churchill wanted to fight. But all they could do was send little pinprick teams across, maybe drop people into France, drop them into Norway, drop them into Holland, occupied territory. Now imagine if you're a Brit or you're an expatriate and you're walking around in Nazi-occupied Germany and you're dealing with the Gestapo, one of the most efficient secret services in the world, and you had to live there, blend in as a citizen, but you were of another kingdom. So you had to live every day on the alert. You had to be in the situation, not of the situation, and know your mission. And ladies and gentlemen, that's the call to discipleship. The danger for some of us is we're so domesticated, we've been sent to Babylon, and we begin to become Babylonians. We lose our kingdom distinctives. 
We lose our sense that we are subversives for the kingdom of God, that there are unseen powers. Listen to this issue of spiritual resistance, which um, Eugene Peterson talks about the heart of a Christian, not, I mean, against their cult, but I'm talking about the unseen powers, the, the seductions of wealth and power or ideology or nationalism or all kinds of things. That's why I resisted the vote for Scottish independence, not because I wouldn't like to have the idea of a free country, but anti-Englishness to me isn't enough to give me a reason to vote for something. And we peddle all these ideologies, and as Christians, we must find our center in his gospel, in his kingdom. Eugene Peterson, not a day goes by but what we have to deal with that ancient triple threat that Christians in the Middle Ages summarized under the headings of the world, the flesh, the devil. The world, the society of proud and arrogant humankind that defies and tries to eliminate God's rule and presence in history. The flesh, the corruption that sin has introduced into our very appetites and our instincts. And the devil, the malignant will that tempts and seduces us away from the will of God. Remember, we are facing an intelligent enemy with real power and real abilities. So this isn't a game. Christianity isn't for suckers. It's for those who are serious and are willing to pay the price. And there are daily pressures and temptations and seductions. Peterson says we've been, we have to contend with all of this. We're in a battle. There's a fight to be waged. And that comes to us in different, different forms. I put these references in your, your notes and you can look them up on your time. But the cultural pressure you see in the Gospels in Luke chapter 11, 14 through 16, or Luke 13, 10 through 17, and Acts chapter 17, where Jesus is preaching. And immediately, obviously, he's challenging the status quo with, with the Jews. And there's religious questions and opposition against what he says. And today, it's no different from the opposition that was faced in the early days. Listen to some of these voices, both from today and some from history. Richard Dawkins, who's a best-selling author, has authored that now has sold millions of books around the world, describes this. He says, faith is an evil precisely because it requires no justification and brooks no argument. Do you agree with that? This whole weekend is about looking for arguments, giving ideas, talking about reasons for our faith. But many people in the cultural world believe there are no reasons for Christianity. Friedrich Nietzsche, the concept of God invented as the antithesis of life. Everything harmful, poisonous, slanderous, the whole hostility unto death against life synthesized in a gruesome unity. So for Nietzsche, Christianity was sucked the life out of life. And many of your friends think the same way. You become a Christian and, hey, join the party, people. Come out with us in the weekend. Live it up. Don't go to church and do all that boring stuff, whatever it is you do in there. And this is the challenge in which we have to engage. Christopher Hitchens, religion poisons everything. The mood has to be reckoned with. So as we're going about our apologetic, we need to try and think of the mindset. How do we shatter that? How do we get involved with these people? How do we hear their objections? How do we take their anger? Not defensively, but we let people spew out their bile at times and try to correct the caricatures, always being prepared to give a reason for the hope that we have with gentleness and respect. Political pressure, a second area. Let's look at a couple of those passages, that chapter 16. Can I ask the people who have got the lights on here to just dim these about? I'm going to fry or melt. I'm going to be like the, the witch and, you know, melting, I'm melting. I really am, by the way, so thank you, thank you. I thought I was being interrogated. I was back in an arrest situation. <laughs> In Acts chapter 16, you see something of the clash of the gospel because of the gospel of the kingdom of God. The crowd rose up in 22 against them. The chief magistrates tore their robes off them and, and proceeded to order them to be beaten with rods. When they had struck them with many blows, they threw them into prison, commanding the jailer to guard them securely. And he, having received such a command, threw them into the inner stocks and fastened their feet with the stocks. So here's Paul in Acts chapter 17, 6 through 9, a similar type of thing. When they did not find them, they began dragging Jesus and some of the brethren before the city authorities, saying, these men who have upset the world, they've disturbed the, the public order, have come here also. And Jason has welcomed them. And they all act contrary to the decrees of Caesar, saying, what? There is another king. They stirred up the crowd and the city authorities who heard these things. And when they had received the pledge from Jason, they released them. So there was an authority question. Whose authority do we bow to? You see, the problem is not that we're challenging political structures because we're not. We're preaching the gospel of liberation. But the gospel of freedom, of secular freedom, is now a mantra. And Christianity is going head to head with a clashing view of freedom. 
Contrary to what President Bush said, the freedom of Americans is not the freedom that everybody around the world either believes in nor wants. And biblical freedom and those things are not the same thing. They're clashing definitions of this issue of freedom. And these are the battle lines. You see, am I free to do whatever I want, wherever I want, with whoever I want, in any way I want? That's what the modern world thinks is real freedom. You know, when I was a teenager, I, I thought it was great. I would break free from my home because I didn't like my parents. I didn't like my school. didn't like anybody. didn't like anything. But I wanted to be free. So I ran away. And I remember trying to hitchhike down to London in the pouring rain. I'm soaking wet in a thing because I got drunk. And I was standing, you know, hitchhiking. I was telling my, kid, my son Cameron this story the other day. I said, what did, where was I going? I mean, I didn't have any money. I didn't have any destination. I mean, I would have been free to probably get mugged or dumped on the auto, you know, somewhere going down the motorway. But what I thought was freedom was this inner passion for something. I didn't know that what I needed was spiritual liberation. And many people look in freedom for an answer that actually binds them. This is Benjamin Franklin, the great American writer, said, nothing brings more pain than too much pleasure, nothing more bondage than too much liberty. We need to pause, pause this. Thank you. Os Guinness puts this so well. He says, the glory of freedom should never blind anyone to its immoderate nature and therefore the stern requirements that, that surround it. For at the heart of freedom lies a grand paradox the greatest enemy of freedom is freedom. Now, I am not suggesting I want people all bound up. But when your only definition of freedom is negative freedom, freedom from, you have no a definition of positive freedom, as Isaiah Berlin has talked about. What is freedom for? Freedom to be what I'm designed to be. Freedom to love God. Freedom to serve my family. Free to overcome my passions. But marriages break apart. Children destroy their, or rebel against their parents. And people fall apart in their churches because we want to be free to express ourselves. Everybody wants freedom, but we don't want responsibilities. And you need both, ladies and gentlemen. And Christianity calls us to freedom in Christ, but it's freedom in authority under Him, for Him, submitted to Him. But that doesn't mean we're slaves. We are genuinely free, free to love. But love won't do everything because there's some things that love won't do because love is responsible. I don't commit adultery as I travel, not because the law says not to, because I love my wife and because I love my God. Love is the issue. And love overcomes our freedom and regulates it. So the issue in our world today is whose, whose, whose view of freedom is being pushed. The culture thinks we should be free to do autonomous individualism. But what happens if everybody does that which is right in their own eyes and then we try to politicize that into a system, we end up in social chaos. And we are. Anarchy is becoming the rule of thumb. We've tried to make ethical decisions, but ethical decisions have to mean there has to be a shared ethic, a standard that we buy in together. But we don't, because what is it? I'm out for my good, and I don't like your good, and stuff you, and I just want mine. And back again to Beethoven. Me, 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 me. Right? And we think that that will truly liberate, but all it does is bring bondage. So what does the church to do? Matthew chapter 10. Look at what Christ calls us to do. To be his people in a context that's fallen, that's broken, that's challenged, and to engage the world in a meaningful way. Matthew 10 and verses 16 through 20. Jesus says, Behold, I send you as sheep in the midst of wolves, so be shrewd as serpents and innocent as doves. But beware of men, for they will hand you over to the courts, scourge you in their synagogues. You'll even be brought before governors and kings for my sake as a testament to them and the Gentiles. But when, you, when they hand you over, do not worry about, uh, about how or what you were to say. It will be given you in that hour what you are to say. For it's not you who speak, but it's the Spirit of your Father who is in you. So we have to think, being sent out into the world, that our God is creator. He is redeemer. He is the Lord. So what are the things that we must be doing? Our mission is very broad. And, and when the church thought about bringing the gospel and using our apologetic to persuade, there were different areas. We had to witness to the truth that God exists. We had to look, look, witness to goodness. And we had to witness to beauty. So art and education and literature, all of these are areas where Christians testify to help bring in the, the government of God. These are important areas. It's not just to be in the church and doing christian -y things. Those are christian -y things. And so I want us to think about that 
as we think about our witness. First of all, proclamation, witness, and education. Matthew 28, we already mentioned that. As the Father sent me, so send I you. There is a great challenge to persuading people today. Many people are skeptic, but as we begin with their questions, we take their questions seriously, but we need to be in the public square. We need to be in the university, and we need to do this with a lot more savvy and a lot less pizzazz than what we do. Sometimes we go in, and it's so Christians, we, that Christian in its style, people would never come. You go in, and there's no music, and there's no prayer, and there's none of all that stuff. You go in, and you simply give a talk, and you share an idea. You give the Christian perspective. You take Q&A, and you leave. Because we're, it's about their comfort, not about ours. And half the time, we bring people where they'd never come into our context because they don't like that music. They're scared. They, this is all foreign and weird stuff. Some get it, and that's okay. They bring the some who want to. But we've got to be more savvy about our translation process. Austin Farrer was talking about the demonstration of the reasonableness of the gospel. He talked about Lewis, the fact that much of what Lewis did was in the universities. It was also preaching to the, or speaking to British military personnel during the Second World War. Listen to what he said about Lewis's methodology. He says, though argument does not create conviction, the lack of it destroys belief. What seems to be proved may not, may not be embraced, but what no one shows the ability or will to defend is quickly abandoned. Rational argument does not create belief, but it maintains a climate in which belief may flourish. Now, I'm not attacking anyone here, so if you hear that, please, that's not what I'm saying. The church is made up with all kinds of people. That's what a body is. God has chosen the weak things of this world to confound the wise. There are some people who have no degrees and will never have a degree. They don't have to have. Love is the greatest apologetic. But there are some who have degrees and need degrees. And pastors and leaders, you have to create a new kind of missionary. You see, the, 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 the idea of sending someone off with a knapsack and a book of tracts, that works to some degree, and that's great in prayer. And some people will be one that way. But what about the people that have to go into the science department in the university? What about the person who needs to get an advanced literature degree? What about the person who needs to study uh, technology or banking and be able to live in that world and speak as an incarnational missionary? Are you willing to spend $150,000 to get them a PhD? Who we couldn't do that as a church. Why not? And this is why we keep ourselves under under the radar so many times. Why is Islam succeeding? Because Islam not by is only paying people's education. They're buying chairs in universities. And we are piddling around in the shallows, ladies and gentlemen. We need a paradigm shift on this. It's not for everyone, but it is for some. Mission is for everyone. But we need to raise up a new kind of missionary. And we need to engage with the public thought of our world. If we are going to be in culture, we need to contribute to culture. We don't need to talk about it, analyze it, mimic it. We need to make better art, write good books, get involved in the culture. We need to do things that people can demonstrably see, have a Christian stamp on it, but they are qualitatively worth paying attention to. So the first area is proclamation, witness, and education. The second is compassion and redeeming action. And this we see. You see in missions like Charles Colson's prison ministry, RZIM, we have our Wellspring Project, Oasis Ministries, or the International Justice Mission, where people go out and fight not only to see people relieved from the circumstances of oppression and violence and rape and all of those things, but push to have legislation, push to get companies to invest. And some of you are already doing that. I know some speaking to the already converted, but the fact is we need to see more of this, more resourcing, more flow into the kingdom of God. Don't sit back and do nothing. Get educated, get involved, and get informed. But the third area, and this is one that is neglected. I've just met a young lady very briefly, and uh, it was for my friend Bernard, they're part of the group there, that I understand is part of the cultural uh, mission here in, the city, in, 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 in uh, Hong Kong. Christians in the arts. We see the history of people like Lewis, Tolkien, Charles William, Dorothy Sayers, people who saw the idea that we needed to have good art, we needed paintings, we needed sculpture, we needed plays, we needed, we needed all kinds of things, good music. And we don't just need the Christian version of that. We need people, things that people from another broader perspective can see and recognize. This is beauty. Beauty is an apologetic, ladies and gentlemen. Where do we think it comes from? testifying to the glory of God, Christians who can use their art experience and their art understanding as a means of giving back to their creator and as a means of drawing people to the kingdom of God. 
Jacques Maritain, the French writer, put it this way, the dismissal of beauty is quite a dangerous thing, if not for art, which cannot in reality divorce beauty, at least for humanity. The dehumanizing process can be overcome. Art in this connection has an outstanding mission. It is the most natural power of healing, an agent of spiritualization needed by the human community. Art, as long as it remains art, cannot help being intent on beauty. I have seen people in poverty but I've seen sometimes when something happens and people with a little bit of money or just a little bit of expertise or a little bit of something, a color is in their home. Maybe some flowers that are brought in and how that, that beauty gives them a sense of hope and opens up the world towards them. It's a tremendous mission and it's an apologetic area that is sadly neglected. Art can go often where words cannot. And the words then qualify what the artist has done. If you can show then sometimes you have the permission to tell. So let's show as well as tell in our apologetic. But you might be saying, where do I begin with all this? Matthew 6, 33, seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. Seek the kingdom of God. Not assume it's there. And if you don't know what to do, Philippians 4, 6, and 7, be anxious for nothing. I mean, some of you are worry warts, and I know this because we get them at all of our, you know, they come up and say, oh, I haven't read that book, and I haven't read any CDs, and, and somebody quoted R.C. Sproul, I need to read that, and I need to get these 25 books, and, I, and the seminar next week, and I'm, I'm so paralyzed trying to do the right thing, I can't do anything. And if you wait until you've read every book, heard every seminar, gone and got your 14th PhD, you'll be waiting by the time you've finished all your PhDs. Get out and get busy. Seek the power of the Holy Spirit now. Believe that God wants to do something in your university, in your school, and even with your boys. I'm not a very ter terribly articulate, but you're unique. You are you. God has called you, and he wants to use you. You know, people don't get this, and I'm just going to say it anyway. Ravi, forgive me. Ravi is a very shy individual. People don't know this about him. I mean, you see him up here publicly. You see him. He doesn't like arguments, and he doesn't like confrontation. And God takes this shy man from who re actually likes catering and food and loves to show hospitality. That was his dream world. That's what he wanted to do. And he gets called and put out as an evangelist, defending the gospel. I mean, around the world. So don't think he came front-loaded with all this stuff in his brain and his heart. He's obedient, and it takes a toll upon him in a very real sense, but he pays the price of obedience. So don't sit there saying, it can't be me. It can be you. And one of our prayers here for our friends in Hong Kong and all these churches is that you will say yes to the Holy Spirit. You don't know where you're going. You don't know what it looks like. But I'll say yes, Lord, and I'll go on the journey. Abraham went out not knowing where he was going. And many times that's what it's like. We want the destination. He doesn't say where the destination is. Just get going. Get moving. And by the way, the anxiety question, and everything by prayer and supplication. I could tell a story of my son here because some, um, when the kids sometimes, my wife has got great common sense, which is good because I don't have much. Um, but she was very, very practical in a lot of areas. And there was something they were working. I don't even know what the context was, but I remember the story because I'd come home and, and uh, he was struggling with something. And he said, he said, Mary was trying to get him to do this thing. And he says, but mom, I'm scared. She says, that's all right. Just do it scared, but do it. <laughs> and for some of us, that's where we're at in our life. I know my dear friend Tracy, you know, it's a lion's heart to have her up on a platform. She didn't find this easy e either. She prays over her messages. She doesn't feel that this is the thing, but God has called her. She does it scared. We all do it scared. Nabil Qureshi, one of our friends, recently converted from Islam or a few years back, he does it scared at times as well. So sometimes you think that well, this is easy. It's not easy, but it's obedience, and you can do yours. So, very quickly... The apostles in 2 Corinthians chapter 4 reminds us what are we preaching. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm tired of personality ministries and I'm tired of seeing others standing up before the Christ. I'm in RZIM not because of Ravi Zacharias. I love Ravi to death. He's a great man. But I'm in RZIM because of Jesus and so is Ravi. And so is this team. So if you ever see anything different from that, let us know. He's the one that we want to preach. In 2 Corinthians chapter 4, 5 and 6, Jesus, the apostle says, We do not preach ourselves, but Christ Jesus as Lord, and ourselves as your bondservants for Jesus' sake. For God who said, Light shall shine out of darkness, is the one who has shone in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Christ. 
people from all over the world who have seen the light of the glorious gospel of Jesus. There's a difference between being in church and having met Christ. When you really truly have an encounter with Christ, when you really have your heart strangely warmed, when you are born again, when there is that, something happens to you. Jim Elliot, the famous martyr that was killed in Ecuador, said these words, He is no fool who gives what he cannot keep to gain what he cannot lose. And he died because he believed in his Lord in the gospel, but he died being faithful to his mission. Dietrich Bronhofer calls us to costly grace. What is costly grace? Because he saw one of the things that happened in the Reformation was a distortion of the message of grace. And I believe this is more in the modern church than it was even in his time. You see it in America. We see it in Canada. We see it in Australia. We see it in Britain. Christians and Christianettes with a lukewarm gospel, watered down, using the words of grace, but not intent on following the Savior, obeying Him, or doing His will. And here's what Bonhoeffer said is costly grace. Costly grace is the treasure hidden in the field. For the sake of it, a man will gladly go and sell all that he has. It's the pearl of great price to buy which the merchant will sell all of his goods. It's the kingly rule of Christ for whose sake a man will pluck out the eye which causes him to stumble. It's the call of Jesus Christ at which the disciple leaves his nets and follows him. I don't know what that will mean for you. That means something different for everybody. It doesn't mean you say you go home tonight and cash in your bank but for some, your, your check and leave, sell your house and move off, though it might for someone, believe it or not. It could mean that. I've seen it happen. Are you willing, though, if Christ gave you that call to do something like that? So I want to close with three couplets here of three things that we need to be thinking about, three things that we should be bearing in our lives individually. And you've got these, don't rush to take all this on board. I understand that some of this will be processing. Take it home, read, pray, and if anything that you think is not of God, let it fall to the ground. But the things that come from the Holy Spirit, receive them. So what are those three things if we're going to make a difference? The first is courage and conviction. Some of you need to learn to break the sound barrier. You've never done that in your life. You've never opened up and testified. You need courage. And you need conviction to make give.